Hi everyone, welcome to an- another edition of Identity3, a podcast all about Web3 and decentralized identity. Um, today we're excited to be uh, bringing one of our um, earliest partners onto the show. Um, my pleasure to introduce to everyone Greg Twemlow, who is the CEO of Seven Mile. Hi Greg, thanks for coming on. Hi, Nick. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you, and thank you very much for inviting me to join the show. Yeah, our pleasure. And you're coming all the way from Australia. So uh, for me, based in Scotland, we're literally on the other side of the world. So I appreciate you. Yeah, uh, literally. Yeah, it's good. (laughs) Yeah. So, Greg, um, so we'll kind of get right into it. I I think that um, we've been working with, uh, or Doc has been working with Seven Mile for, we've been chatting on and off, I guess, for probably the guts of a year. Um, yeah. They're probably actually working together more closely over the last few months. Um, Seven Mile is a super interesting uh, not-for-profit based um, just outside of Sydney. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about Seven Mile and, and what you're trying to achieve there, please? Yes, of course. So I founded Seven Mile back in 2018, and we are in a region of Sydney called the Northern Beaches. So we're just a little bit north of Sydney across the harbour in what is probably the best part of Sydney, possibly the best part of Australia, but uh, those those might be debatable. Uh, And so what I wanted to do when I started Seven Mile, Nick, was to start a not-for-profit that would work with the people in our community, uh, and our community our region of Sydney is about 270,000 people. Uh, it's about a $17 billion annual GDP economy here, so it's quite a sizable chunk of Sydney. And we wanted to help people who were wanting or needing to start a business and didn't really quite know how to get started. They didn't really know whether they had a good idea, how they could understand whether the idea had a market whether they were problem, uh, solving a problem that, you know, people wanted solved. So typically you might describe those people as people who want to start a lifestyle business, uh, a typical urban economy, and uh, there'd been nothing available to those people pretty much ever in our part of Sydney. So that's what we started to do, and we, we worked with uh, a, quite a few hundred people in the first couple of years. And that was very successful, and we had a lot of great traction, a lot of great uh, coverage and support. And then in early 2020, I was approached by our state education agency, who came to see me and said, hey, we've heard that you're doing great work with innovation and entrepreneurship, and we, we think we could use your help because we need to redesign how we help our high school students develop innovation and entrepreneurship skills. And uh, so that started a whole process and uh, really since early 2020, despite COVID and various lockdowns and things, we've been working very successfully with the education agency, working with high school students of around uh, 15 to 17 years of age. And uh, that has been honestly quite incredible. And it was that work really that prompted me to seek out uh, a blockchain based organization that would enable me to issue credentials to the students who complete our programs. Great. Yeah, thanks, Ty Greg. It's great to hear. And, and what type of um work is it you're doing with students? So you were kind of mentioning at the start how you were really helping uh, lifestyle uh, businesses, um, you know, get broader appeal and probably get some market traction and things like that. How do um, working with uh, kind of younger people and students, uh, how does it fit into that model? Well, it fits into the model in the sense that what we're trying to do, I think, is give those, uh, those 15 to 17 year old students an experience of what it is to be part of the real world. And if you're a parent, you might understand what I mean by that. But, you know, mostly for the for the most part, I think pretty much everywhere, probably in the world, high school students kind of live in a, a bit of a bubble. 
uh, you know, they have minimal interaction with what we might call the real world, with business, etc. And they get very little exposure, if any, to what it means to be uh, running a business, to be part of a business, to be contributing to a business. And that's what happened in early 2020 when this education agency came to see me. They kind of said exactly that. They said, look, literally, they said, we've realized that everything we've been doing to try and give these students an experience of the real world has been a waste of time and money for everybody. And we need to completely rethink how we do that. I mean, to their credit, I think, to be honest. Uh, and so it was like, okay, wow, this was, uh, I mean, I, you know, I welcomed their candor and I thought, well, I, I kind of knew exactly how, what I might do to deliver or design a program that would meet their objectives. And so we set about doing that and we ran a pilot in 2020, which was a tremendous success uh, in the sense that you know, the students actually worked with business owners. They were working to solve real business problems, and it was just a, a fantastic program. Everyone was so excited. And so we sort of built on that in 2021, uh, some COVID restrictions again, but we expanded the pilot. And uh, that all went fabulously well. Everyone was very happy. And so we've continued to expand it. So... I think it was probably around the end of uh, some part of 2021, Nick, that I started to think, I really need to find a, an organisation that, that would enable me to issue blockchain-based credentials that the students who participate in our program could carry with them throughout life. And that's when I found you. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting that... I mean, you're talking as, as kind of a parent of, of a couple of high school aged kids as well. I, I know very much what you mean, like, and even our, our own experiences that when you go through school, uh, everything is out from a textbook, of course. And uh, as you say, you come out of that bubble, whether it's you go into college or university, but at some point you must actually go to the world of work and it's a, a fairly uh, harsh shock. It's a bit like jumping into an ice bath. And so if you're getting that early experience through a program like yourself, yeah, I could definitely see an upside um, for that as well. Um, and, and interesting what you're also saying about credentials as well and the desire to have students own their own credentials because certainly when I was at, and I know I'm probably looking about 21, 22 just now, but believe it or not, I was at school a little bit longer ago. And uh, even <laughs> back then you got paper-based certificates um, that were easy to forge. You could scan them and maybe put them into PDFs and, and distribute them that way, you know, in a digital sense, but very easy to forge. And, uh, and people didn't really um, move credentials about in that, in that way back then. I mean, you literally, if you went to an interview, you handed somebody uh, your, your, uh, you know, your degree or whatever it was. So we're living in very different times and important that when we're digitizing um, all of these credentials that, that were, were um, making sure that the students can own them as well. So I think that's very much a key point. Yeah, it was, it was very much front of mind for me that I, I mean, I just think the concept of issuing in the 21st century, issuing a paper-based credential is almost meaningless. Uh, and of course, paper-based credentials get lost, they get misplaced. Uh, so, what's, you know, I mean, I, I just I knew that we had to be able to do better for the students who participated in our programs. Yeah. And the other thing that we see as well is that even if you went to a digital like but a, a company, let's say, that was issuing them where they basically were stored on this company's, um, you know, servers and stuff like that. What happens when that company disappears? Um, you know, the students are effectively yeah. left maybe nothing because maybe the place that those credentials were stored ceases to be paid for and therefore exist. And so the ability to for the, the student to actually manage their own credentials uh, is, is key. Yes, I, I agree. And I, I've thought for a very long time, because as you said, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've had three boys who've grown up and they've gone through high school and college and, you know, they've got their own lives now. But but I reflected a lot on the fact that, you know, as they went through life, they were developing skills through for various reasons in school and in part-time work and various other activities. 
and none of those skills were ever tracked or recorded in any meaningful way for them to be able to use. So, I mean, I've got a, a, a very broad interest in, in particularly what you're doing and the ability to enable young people to track the skills they develop through their life from a probably potentially a quite young age uh, and carry with them for their, for their whole career, their whole working life. Yeah. And I think like we were talking before, Greg, and uh, I think we were discussing there how with like a formalized education system, we just tend to track the big stuff, right? So like you've passed your O-level maths or your, your uh, Nat 5 maths as it would be in the UK or your higher or something like that. Um, or you get a degree certificate as well, but there's all those small incremental skills that you pick up. And sometimes they can be soft skills as well, which the current education system is, is not particularly effective or is not, not effective at all at actually tracking. Not at all. And in, in our environment, you know, the, the students go through 12 years of schooling and they end up with a number. It, uh, the number here is, is called an ATAR. I'm not even sure what the acronym means. You, you were referring to the same sort of thing. And they, this number is somehow magically meant to represent the capabilities and capacities of this of a person. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a crazy concept, to be honest. And it is much more about the skills profile of a person. Uh, and so that's what, uh, to be honest, this work that we've been doing for the last couple of years with young people is actually the best working experience of my career. I mean, it, 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 hands down, it is just so amazing. And we focus on a suite of nine life skills uh, or humanity skills and... Uh, that's the basis on which we run this program. And, you know, the, the, they include things like entrepreneurship and creative thinking and collaboration, self-management, listening, writing, persuading, you know, all those sorts of really important skills that people can actually use all through their life. Yeah, no, it sounds like very, very rewarding as well. I think also like one thing that we talk about, like having credentials, like a big part of, how verifiable credentials differ, differ from like uh, non-verifiable credentials um, is things like privacy as well. So, and it's something that seems to be um, that younger people are maybe more and more conscious of than maybe my generation were um, because the, the internet <clears throat> was new, it was exciting and everyone was using it without really much regard for who actually held the data, you know, who was effectively owning that data. Uh, it transpires that it's actually the companies um, and uh, and now that there's been this kind of this movement towards trying to uh, put the ownership of data back into control of the users where it should be. And it seems to me at least that maybe that younger generation that are kind of coming through now, school now, are much more privacy conscious than, than maybe uh, people that went before. And of course, a great thing about verifiable credentials is um, if, if done correctly, of course, is the ability for that individual just to manage and control their own and potentially they control who gets to see their credentials. It's not necessarily a government or some kind of institution. Uh, an important part is they can actually decide who they want to see the, the you know, certain types of skills, which is key. Is that something that you, you see yourself? Oh, absolutely, Nick. And uh, I think, as you say, younger people, certainly the uh, cohorts that we work with, the 15, 16, 17 year olds, uh, they're very conscious of the fact that they, they want to own their data and they want to control it and they want to control who has access to it. And they want to control the ability to make those credentials available to, to specific people when it's appropriate. And for people that are not super familiar with uh, verifiable credentials, generally these are held in a, in a wallet, um, which is just a, a kind of a, a place to store it on normally traditionally someone's mobile device. And so they would store these credentials um, and basically be able to send out presentations or representations of these credentials to um, institutions that want to verify uh, their qualifications. So these are all held entirely by the individual. When we're talking about blockchain-based credentials, 
actually what we're putting on the blockchain is just these uh, anonymous or pseudo-anonymous identifiers that represent the issuer, uh, which in this case uh, would be Seven Mile, and then the, the recipient, which is the student. And of course, the credential itself is stored um, away in the, the uh, individual or the student's wallet. So um, just uh, to, uh, before we get any kind of haters online saying that you shouldn't be putting <laughs> Stuff on blockchains, what we're putting on is just the, the identifiers, the blockchain, the credential itself is, is held by the recipients. Yes, and, and I was I was very conscious of protecting the identity of students. Like there was no way that I would compromise their private information in any way, which is one of the other reasons, which is, you know, what I, I loved when I discovered Doc was that that met that very important criteria. And what do you see like the impact of this technology uh, more generally having on education, Greg? I mean, I know you're, you're very um, fixed within uh, kind of young learners, but I mean, more broadly speaking, do, do you see it having an impact across um, other forms of education? Oh, yes, absolutely. And you can think of for younger people being able to track the skills they develop through the course of their education and then as they graduate education into, let's colloquially call it the real world, which I don't necessarily like that term, but it probably works, you know, and, and ongoing. And the, the minute they leave the education bubble and start working, they're, they're going into, they're embarking on a new journey of skills development. And they should be able to track those skills and to be able to manage them and to be able to make them available when they need to, to, to the appropriate person when applying for a job, for example. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think as well, like what we see is a lot of, um, and I don't know if this is a, a thing that's, that you're noticing yourself, but obviously there's a, quite a lot of, there's some really interesting stuff online about like, um, forgeries and, and people faking credentials as well. And it's actually is that, you know, if you look into it more and more online, Francisco and I have talked about, you know, started to loosely plan how we could develop a, a podcast episode around the kind of business of, of um, you know, tampering with um, educational certificates to obviously get jobs and things like that. But it seems as it's certainly a multi almost billion dollar industry. Um, and I think having a technology where not only can the individual can, can control their credentials, but also when they're sending off to a university or they're sending off to a future employer, they can actually check whether, just checking the, I'm not getting into too much technical blurb here, but they're able to tell how, if the credential is actually valid or not, and it was actually issued to that specific individual. So I think yes. uh, that's going to be a key part as well. Well, and I think being able to do that actually sets that person apart as being someone who is conscious of the issue and wants to take that issue away so that whoever they're presenting the credential to can feel comfortable and confident that they're dealing with someone who is ethical and aware of this terrible nefarious issue of, you know, counterfeiting and all that sort of thing. Yeah, no, definitely. And as we as we mentioned at the start, Greg, you and I are, are I don't know, are 20,000, 25,000 miles apart. Um, <laughs> what made you choose Doc? Well, look, Nick, uh, all I knew was I got to the point where I thought I need to find a solution that I can make part of what we provide to the young people that we train. And I started looking. I, I mean, I had a general uh, awareness and appreciation of blockchain technology. I, I guess I've, I've been interested in it from maybe 10 or so years ago. And I thought, wow, this is something that's got tremendous potential. So I was certainly aware of blockchain. And I started looking. And to be honest, I can't quite remember how I stumbled across Doc and you. But when I reached out uh, to sort of, ha you know, have an initial conversation, what was wonderful was that I was, you know, I had a response from the person who was running a blockchain credentialing system. And uh, I think, you know, immediately, I mean, I certainly felt very comfortable that I was talking to someone who knew what they were doing and, and was like-minded. 
And I think one of the things as well that when we first spoke, Greg, like we were very keen to start working with you, but we you know all, all this technology is relatively new. Um, so, so, you know, really decentralized identity and blockchains really kind of started to Phoenix around 2016. Uh, and companies since then have been frantically trying to package the technology in such a way that it's usable. And so probably when we started speaking maybe a year or so ago, we actually had a very developer centric offering where you would have needed to have had um, access to like developer resources to build with our um, either our API or SDK. And I said that that was something that, that um, you know, you just didn't have, uh, and a lot of people don't yeah. have, and we're asked for this quite often. And yeah. uh, it was speaking to people like yourself where we actually realized people without, you know, technical, deep technical knowledge, you obviously like had a, a kind of good understanding of blockchain, you know, on a foundational level, but in terms of developing with it, uh, that, that was obviously something that, that wasn't available. So developing a solution that uh, no, you know, people without development experience could use was obviously key for us. And so we built a no code solution. Um, and so that was maybe that kind of reignited our kind of um, uh, relationship, I guess, into you actually starting to, to use Doc uh, and issuing uh, credentials yourself. Absolutely. And that was so, so important because we, we don't have uh, developer resources of any kind. So I think I probably very early on kind of made that, I, I fessed up that that was the case uh, because I thought I didn't, I, you know, I certainly don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time. Uh, if you thought that we had developer people, we didn't, uh, but we still wanted to access the functionality and that's what you've made available to us, which is just fantastic. Oh, it's been our pleasure. It's been great to see you guys grow as well. So, so then looking forward, um, so you mentioned at the start, Greg, where you're in a pilot phase. Um, what kind of size is that right now? And then what are your aspirations for, for the, those pilots over the next kind of one or two years? So it's, it's very exciting in a sense, you know, uh, we, we started, we did that initial pilot in 2020. 2020 and 2021 were constrained by COVID lockdowns. I think like everywhere, you know, our schools were being locked down, then they were opening, then they were closing. So our pr progress in 2020, 2021 was kind of slow. This year, we've expanded by uh, training teachers to deliver our program, which was an experiment, to be honest, because neither we nor the education agency, the state education agency, really kind of knew whether that was going to work, given, you know, the typical background of a teacher. But nonetheless, we did, we trained the t t uh, teachers from 10 schools in March. Uh, then in May, June, those teachers delivered the program. It actually worked brilliantly. Uh, the teachers did a fabulous job. We obviously supported them. And so there's now a great deal of confidence to uh, progress now uh, in early 2023, we're going to train 100 teachers from 50 high schools. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's a management sort of challenge around that, kind of obviously, as you grow to that scale. But uh, what, the, what the State Education Agency wants to do is by 2024, they want all 1,500 high schools in our state to be able to access the program which means a pretty rapid growth. And if 1,500 high schools uh, each running the program every year and training 30 to 50 students, then it's, it's the numbers are pretty big, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, which is exciting, daunting, but, you know, basically exciting. And that's just in our one state, uh, New South Wales, the state of New South Wales in Australia, there's about 8 million residents, about 1,500 high schools. I mean, so, you know, and we're already having conversations with people in other countries and, you know, we're at the point where we're, we're very confident that what we're doing is truly making an impact. And last night we had an event, uh, we had an inter-school competition event, which was uh, sponsored by uh, a FinTech Corporation. So that was our first actual corporate sponsor support. 
Uh, and it was absolutely amazing. It was just so fantastic, and everyone was thrilled uh, with the whole process and the event, and the, the students were, you know, just amazing, just amazing. <laughs> and how the teachers' reaction been? So, so you get teachers there who are um, obviously um, moving through a very structured education program. Uh, what's their response like been to something? Yeah, that's so <laughs> yeah. Different? So, Have they yeah. been on board? Or, yeah. Oh yeah, so I uh, so I think, and and when I talked to the um, our sponsor in the education agency about this, you know, we both realised that what we were wanting to do was not something that was appropriate for all teachers. Teaching is a career path that people come out of school, high school, go into college, come into the school, and they they're kind of in a groove, right, and they just basically move on that groove you know often for their whole career until they hit 60 or 65 and then they you know hang up the shingle and go off and play golf but but that's not all that's not all teachers you know and so we knew we wanted to target teachers who were more innovative and entrepreneurial uh, and there's definitely a percentage of teachers who have that mindset uh, and so they're, they're the teachers we're targeting. And so, of course, we every time we run a program, whether it, we're training students or teachers, we capture assessment data. And the assessment data from the teachers was basically, broadly, this is the most amazing experience of my teaching career. And um, I would never have learnt these skills uh, normally in this career, except, you know, with you guys. And so that's kind of excited them and got them on a whole new track, uh, which is exciting to see. And it's something that I wanted to achieve when I did the first program design back in 2020. I, in my mind, you know, we were focused on the students, but I thought, you know, we can really impact the careers of teachers as well here. And, and we've proven that now this year. So that's been wonderful. And you're actually issuing, as I understand it, credentials to the, the teachers as well as the students. So, so Oh, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Every, everyone who participates and completes the program is issued a, a DOC blockchain credential. Fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, and, and before we wrap up then, Greg, so if, if there's anyone listening who is really taken with the idea and wants to look at discussing a similar program in their state or country, or if there's a teacher who's somewhere in New South Wales or somewhere else in Australia or the world that's also interested in participating, how should they get in touch with you? Well, uh, our, our not-for-profit website is sevenmile.org.au, S-E-V-E-N, mile.org.au. That's, that's the simplest place to start. There's a lot of uh, material there. We, we've made, we've been very careful with the work we've done to do a lot of detailed reporting. There's a lot of video content. So anyone who wants to do a deep dive can, can take a look at that on the sevenmiles.org.au website. The whole, all the programs are built on a pedagogical model that I designed. And Nick, you would know what pedagogy means. See, when you said that, I've got no idea what you mean. Like <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Not many people do. I mean, te teachers do. But pedagogy is about defining learning outcomes from any kind of training intervention. So, so the pedagogy is about the learning outcomes. And so I devised a pedagogical model it was built on nine hum life skills or humanities skills. And so all of, all of the programs that we run are based on that pedagogical model. So it's all very solidly anchored in a, a very strong pedagogy. Uh, for any teachers or educators who, you know, might be listening, they'd go, oh, okay, that's a good thing, you know, because uh, they'll understand what pedagogy is. Um, so, like, I would love to, uh, I would love to work with, uh, you know, Scotland or Portugal or, you know, wherever, because what we've proven now is that we, the programs make uh, an impact. We absolutely have proven that. So anyone in any country who said, oh, this sounds good, they could initially feel confident and comfortable that this thing is now proven here. 
Yeah. So I'm hoping, Nick, that in the coming years we're going to be issuing tens of thousands of DOC blockchain credentials. That's my hope. Yeah, and, and ours too. And, uh, I think that, I think that um, yeah, I mean, you're doing a lot of great work there and it seems to be benefiting everyone that's part of that whole ecosystem, both the students, companies, teachers. Um, so uh, it seems yeah. like a very, very worthy cause. Uh, it, it's, uh, look, honestly, it's a kind of a good news factory. Like, any way you care to look at it, there's a good news story from any perspective of any stakeholder. And like I said, Nick, it's the it's the most exciting work I've done in my my career, and uh, I just want to. I hope I can keep doing it for years to come. <laughs> Great. Well, we're excited to be a part of it. But uh, listen, Greg, thank you very much. I think we'll wrap it here. Thank you very much for for taking the time uh, to to jump on. Really enjoyed talking with yeah. you, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. And, and Nick, uh, can I just say it's been an absolute pleasure and you have always been so responsive to any questions or issues or assistance that we've sought. And it's an absolute pleasure to work with you and with Doc. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs>